Finally, the time has come. You no longer have to choose between conventional medicine and alternative medicine. Today, unlike years past, your team of doctors from all disciplines are working together side by side for the benefit of you, the patient, to help you regain your health and cross the bridge. Hello again. Welcome back to The Bridge to Health. My name is Dr. Tom Dow. And each week on our show, we have a specialist from a different healthcare discipline um, who works with our healthcare team for you, the patient. And as I've said on many different shows, our model of healthcare is the wheel of health. The wheel of health is a five spoke wheel where each spoke, if, if, the, spokes are, if the spoke is tight, the wheel rolls perfectly straight and that represents somebody in excellent optimal health. The five spokes of the health wheel are proper nervous system function, rest, mental state, exercise, and diet. So if any one of those spokes becomes weak, the wheel starts to wobble and that has a direct impact on the other spokes. As an example, we have a patient come into our office patient complains of lower back pain. And again, we have four multidiscipline offices, um, one in Melville, one in Hicksville, one in Ronkonkoma, and one in Medford, which have many different specialists all in the same facility working as a team. So we have a patient come in and let's see they see the chiropractor first for low back pain. On our history, we then discover that this person has low back pain because he's about 300 pounds. He needs to lose about 75 pounds uh, in order to take the pressure off his back. We also learned that the reason why he's 300 pounds is because um, he is depressed. He has a bad mental attitude. He is not happy about the way his life is going. So the way he hides that pain is he eats food for pleasure because he's not getting that anywhere else. And of course now when that patient is in that kind of pain, that kind of depression, he's not going to feel like exercising and he can't sleep at night. So because one spoke becomes weak, all the other spokes now become affected, the wheel wobbles like crazy, and the person's health is very, very bad shape. So today we have the honor of having a special guest, Dr. Anne-Marie Lepore. Hi, Anne-Marie. Thank you for joining us on the show today. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> and Dr. Lepore is a neuropsychologist who works with our team um, covering uh, emotional and cognitive issues related to accidents and injuries that people come into with our, at our office, uh, dealing with conditions like post-concussion syndrome, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, as well as possible emotional consequences to injuries from these accidents. So Dr. Lapori, could you uh, just explain to me exactly what is a neuropsychologist? Well, lots of people don't really know what a neuropsychologist is. A neuropsychologist is a psychologist who is trained to deal with brain behavior relationships. Uh, so we focus on how the brain works uh, and specifically cognitive functioning. And cognitive functioning has to do with thinking skills, things like attention, memory, problem solving, how you, how you put together visual spatial information, how you put together language based information, um, how you're able to recall memories, mm -hmm. problem solving, being able to shift from one task <coughs> to another, so it really encompasses a lot. And that is, that's a special training for a psychologist, or is that part of every psychologist training? No, it's a specialized training for certain psychologists. And so, actually, with neuropsychologists, some do primarily just cognitive assessments, looking to see after an accident how somebody's cognitive functioning is doing in these different areas, because really what happens is we use all these tasks, when we're doing re like everyday tasks, what happens is we use all these cognitive functions all together. Okay, so, I, let, let me interrupt just for one second. Sure. When you say cognitive functions, explain to, the explain to the audience what are cognitive functions that you're looking at. Is it thinking? What is it? Yeah, it's things like <coughs> attention, uh, how you're able to process things that you see visually, being able to find your way in space, um, how you're able to process language-based information, how you're able to switch from one task to another, how you're able to form memories, recall memories, recognize information, um, how you're able to do problem solving. 
So, so, it's a, so it encompasses so, a lot. So after accidents, like car accidents and, and other traumas, these functions, you're, I, I guess you're saying, become diminished. People have a hard time concentrating as a result of a car accident. Uh, people have a hard time putting pieces together and understanding how things work due to, due to the things that happen to their brain as, as a result of this trauma, right? Sometimes. Uh, if a person has a, a head injury, they could have difficulty with any of these cognitive functions. And we'll talk a little bit about what happens in a head injury, I guess, a, a little bit later on. I wanted to cover that. Okay. Um, but also, sometimes emotionally things are difficult. So if you can imagine for yourself, if you're feeling very anxious or you're feeling very sad or down, it actually, that also impacts your cognitive functioning. Sure. So sometimes what happens is you have to be able to distinguish uh, what's emotional and what's purely cognitive due to uh -huh. organic And sometimes do, after somebody has an accident and they haven't been able to work for so many months, haven't been able to perform their household chores like they used to, uh, enjoy things with their family, this can lead to these kinds of things too, right? Absolutely. I mean, right. after you have an accident, just think about it. Sometimes you have an injury where you can't return to work. Um, you can't perform tasks as you usually do at home. Uh, and so there's a huge change in terms of your life functioning. Right. There's financial worries that you have to be concerned about. Your whole lifestyles change. You're going to different doctors instead right. of just going and doing your everyday right. task. You don't know exactly right, right. when thing you know when things are going to change back to right. when it was normal, like it was before. And it also affects the whole family too when they oh see gosh. these changes, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Because right. uh, it causes. I always say illness and injury happens to one person physically but it actually impacts the entire family. Right. So, so I'm sure most people are familiar with what a concussion is, um, where somebody has an accident and their brain is, is traumatized, um, and you treat a condition called post-concussion syndrome. Can you explain to us what that is? Um, well, first I want to get into what a concussion is because I don't sure. think it's that easily understood. Okay. Uh, most people think of a brain injury as when you've had some sort of hit or impact to the head uh, and typically there's a loss of consciousness and then you're having difficulty with any of the thinking skills that we described earlier. Mm -hmm. um, with a concussion, it happens to be a very mild brain injury. Um, so, you know, sometimes during a car accident, uh, you have a whiplash injury. Right. If your head, you know, if even if you don't lose consciousness, you might actually find that you're having cognitive issues afterwards. Well, we, well, we found from research um, that if, if you just imagine a water balloon inside of a, a, a coconut, <clears throat> and all of a sudden you shake that coconut, that water balloon is bouncing off the inside exactly. of the coconut. Exactly. And even and we've had many people, patients who have had accidents come to our centers, have normal MRIs, but yet they still have these cognitive difficulties because of the changes I think that you're talking about, right. which are in post-concussion syndrome, even though there's no diagnostic test which shows like, a positive finding. It's exactly. this, this is how is this diagnosed by you? Is this diagnosed by like just questionnaires or, or talking to the patients? Well, some of it is talking to the patient and seeing what issues that they're having. If they feel as though they're foggy, they can't really think clearly. Um, certainly, if they're having any visual difficulty, sometimes people experience double vision after this. Um, if they're having any memory issues, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and actually sometimes or, or attention issues, difficulty focusing. So it could be any of those things. And then also we do cognitive tests. Um, so these cognitive tests actually look at very specific aspects of memory, attention, language processing. Because like I said before, we, do, we use all of these seamlessly in everyday life. So what these tests do is it helps us to tease apart exactly what's going on. So I have an interesting question. What, so you see a patient after an accident and you do these tests, these memory tests, these cognitive tests, and you score them to see how they do. How do you know what their baseline was before that accident? It's a great question. I get that question all of the time. Yeah. Um, <coughs> well, it would be wonderful if we all just had neuropsych evaluations yeah, right. <laughs> of baseline before and we can compare them, yeah. but we don't. Uh, so typically what we do is we use certain things to estimate what pre-injury functioning is. So for an example, if you have somebody who graduated high school or maybe even college, um, and then is working full time and is independent in their functioning, uh, is able to do household tasks, just doing their everyday functioning. 
but you're finding that their scores on tests of cognitive functioning are greatly impaired, mm -hmm. well, then this is a change in functioning. We're right. basically using educational and occupational functioning right. to kind of estimate what their functioning was previously. Wow. In addition, there are certain cognitive t uh, tasks that tend to be hold up over time. Mm. So for example, information that you've learned throughout your lifetime mm. is something that you tend to hold on to. Mm. So even if you have an injury, that tends to hold up. So <coughs> things that you learned in school or your vocabulary, sometimes we'll do tests in those areas and we'll actually see mm -hmm. that there's a discrepancy between those scores and some of the other scores. That wow, that's have. really interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you ever bring the family members in and ask them, question them as to how mom was before this accident, how she is now, the way our memory is. Do we ever use family members? Sometimes, sometimes, particularly if um, if the person is particularly impaired in terms of what's going on at home. Yeah. So, what do you do with these patients and uh, to help treat them? I mean, what kind of treatment is there for people with post-concussion syndrome? Well, one of the good things about post-concussion syndrome uh, is that it's usually a temporary disorder, usually. Mm -hmm. um, so usually within a few weeks to a couple of months, they'll find that their cognitive functioning is improving. Okay. Um, but still, I mean, if you're not able to remember things, right. if you're forgetting appointments, if you're forgetting things that you need to do day to day, if you find right. that you're fatigued, I mean, this really impacts your ability to function every day. Right. So um, sometimes I'll try to work out with them ways to develop compensatory strategies. Right. Like for example, you can't do your finances because it's too hard to concentrate or you keep making mistakes, have a family member take that over for the time being. Right. Um, if you're finding that you're forgetting things, uh, use reminders for yourself. I, right. I love the fact that we have these cell phones now where you can set thank, alarms for thank things. Thank God for my cell exactly. phone, man. I forget half the things I have to do in a day if that thing didn't beep. Right. So <laughs> you can use those to compensate for memory difficulties. Right. Also, um, sometimes if you set up routines for yourself, Mm -hmm. um, and you do things uh, kind of like on your own schedule, right. like if you have a certain task that you have to complete weekly, you know Monday is the day that you do that task, right. then you've now made it into a rule, and it's not something that you will tend to forget. Right. Um, you'll just tend to do it regularly that way. Right. In addition, I just want to add, sometimes sure, sure, people sure. experience sure. a lot of fatigue after they've had a head injury. Um, so what I ask people to do sometimes is to just take a, like a weekly planner where you could just jot down a rating for yourself, like every hour or two hours, how fatigued do you feel? Mm -hmm. And notice if you notice any patterns. So if you're noticing that you're more fatigued later in the day, well then what you may do is you may actually uh, perform some of your more difficult tasks earlier in the day. So you're teaching them coping strategies. Exactly. The, there's a, in the legal arena, we deal with a lot of car accident victims and many times attorneys want narratives and reports on you know, what their injuries are and how they're doing. Um, the big thing they always ask me is, does the patient have a TBI or a traumatic brain injury? Can you kind of explain what a TBI is and is post-concussion syndrome a form of TBI? Are there other types of TBIs? Absolutely. Try to explain to what sure. that is. Well, a uh, traumatic brain injury is basically what it sounds like, an injury that you have to the brain. That could be due to a car accident, it could be due to a fall, it could be due to being in a fight or, or violence, hit to a head. Um, so that's generally what a traumatic brain injury is. Um, and post-concussion syndrome is, well, concussion is a mild brain injury. So post-concussion syndrome has to do with the symptoms people experience after they have a mild brain injury. So mm -hmm. if there's any sort of loss of consciousness, typically the loss of consciousness is very short, and sometimes it might not even exist. Right. Um, but sometimes with a more severe brain injury, usually we can gauge how severe the brain injury is by the right. length of loss of consciousness. So if somebody's had a loss of consciousness for a day or more, if they've been in a coma, mm -hmm. this is much more serious than a than concussion, obviously. Right. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to add is that sometimes people get into multiple accidents. So they have concussion and then they have another concussion. You see that right. a lot in, in yeah. sports like yeah. in the NFL. Right, right, right. You know, and then what happens is concussion after concussion leads to more progressive brain right. Yeah, I had a patient I referred to you with in exactly yes. that situation. Exactly. And um, you actually did a great report and kind of like analyzed how they were after accident one, what the changes were and how that patient improves after accident one and then the effects of accident two, right. which I find like pretty amazing how you, you, you gave the, a whole battery of different 
um, I don't know what you call them, questionnaires or... Neuropsych tests. Neuropsych yeah. tests, yeah. <laughs> that uh, came up with scores and everything. And I thought it was very, very amazing you were able to do such a great job with that. Thank you. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about after somebody has a, an injury, what are some common emotional responses they well, feel, they, they experience after these uh, injuries? Let's say car accidents, whiplashes, that kind of thing. Well, um, certainly there, this <coughs> causes a huge change in their lives. Um, they'll find, like we talked about before, they can't work, they can't do the same things that they always do. Um, sometimes people become very anxious about this. They mm. worry about the future. Um, they worry about when they're going to get better. And sometimes people will experience depression where they feel very sad about this. They mm -hmm. feel hopeless. They can remember very easily what they did before and now they're finding that they're having such a hard time uh, doing the same things that they did before. It can really Do they ever get away. angry? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and sometimes even, you know, it's hard, to, like I said before, it's hard to tease out. Sometimes when you have a brain injury, this is going to cause a change in your emotions too, because right. our emotions are mediated by brain functions. Right. Um, but if you also find that you're, you know, everything has changed, it can be overwhelming and you could become angry. Do you ever find that a patient comes in from an accident, you start working on their, their resp emotional responses as a result of that accident, and you dig up old things Absolutely. from before the accident Absolutely. that have now become triggered by that trauma. Do you find that? Um, things that have become triggered by the trauma of yeah. the accident? Well, let's say they may have forgotten all those things and they were coping fine before this accident happened. Now the accident happens and you now start to explore and a lot of the things you're feeling are, are from things that happened to them in the past before the accident which now have become exacerbated by the accident. Well, actually, um, that's an interesting question. Uh, <coughs> sometimes having gone through a life-threatening accident is actually a trauma. The, uh, the, the accident itself is just so overwhelming. In that moment, it feels like you're going to die. Right. And what ends up happening is that your brain in that state, even if you never had a head injury, right. your car is spinning around and you're thinking, this is it, I'm going to die. Right. Um, you're not processing information the way that you normally do. Right. Um, the information that comes in is in a completely different milieu. Uh, you might be finding that your heart is racing, that you're becoming overwhelmed, uh, and your brain is just not laying down memories as it normally does. And is that's that, what we call a trauma. Is that response called panic disorder or no. a panic attack? No. Can people get panic disorder from a trauma? Uh, sometimes, yes. What ha it's not panic, necessarily. We, we separate these out. Okay. Um, panic has more to do with uh, an anxious response, uh, and it could be due to anything. Uh, it, may not, it might not even be due to anything in particular. Okay. But typically what happens in panic is that a person finds that not only are they anxious, but when they're anxious, they find that they have difficulty breathing, which right. then makes them more anxious, which right. then makes it more difficult to breathe. And that's usually what the cause of panic is. Well, in practice, we we see that not a lot, but but every now and then we'll have a patient come in. Oh, I can't breathe. Uh, my my heart's racing, um, and we try to find a physical reason for that. Right. And we can't find anything. Mm -hmm. And then as a result, we they eventually go to the ER, and they do the same thing. They can't find anything, and they tell them they're having a panic attack. Right. <coughs> um, and but and there are sometimes we found that people have those symptoms and they're telling them they have a panic attack and that it's something organic that we do find and it's really not a panic attack. Right. So I know that's a very um, difficult condition to treat panic disorder, correct? Right, but also what happens, well, we can teach people strategies to work with it if they understand what's going on because when it comes to anxiety um, and panic, really we experience our emotions quite bodily. Um, so when people are having a panic attack for the first time, what often happens is they don't think of it, as you mentioned, as a panic attack. It feels like, oh my God, I'm having a heart attack, I'm dying. It feels like okay. they're going to die. That's exactly. What they but when you educate <coughs> them as to what a panic attack is, right. and you teach them strategies to cope with it, or to maybe even prevent it, right. um, then you can help them. Why is it that some people can cope with those different stressors, and other people can't and exhibit these symptoms. Uh, that is the million-dollar question. Yeah, be, <laughs> right? because I mean, uh, 
is it organic? Is it in the? Is it something biochemical in the brain? Could be. Is it something from the way they were brought up? And yes, it could be. It could be a million different things. Exactly, exactly. Hmm. It could be a million different things, and you know what? We're a combination of all of those things. Right. And in some cases, no matter what we do as a, as a, as clinicians, there is a role of medication sometimes. Absolutely. Which which, which they have to have. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Um, so. When do you think a person who's feeling these emotional responses um, after an injury seek help? Should they try to deal with it by themselves for a while? Should they seek help right away? Or it depends on the level of their symptoms? Um, it did, well, yes to all of those questions okay. because certainly <coughs> it makes sense that after you've had an accident, when your life has changed so dramatically, that you're going to experience some anxiety, that you're going to experience some sadness. Uh, these are normal emotions. Uh, when it becomes something where it impacts your ability to work on your recovery, and I see this lots of times where people say, you know what, I just I can't do physical therapy. I just can't get up and do it. It's just right. too much. They need to get help right. because at that point it's impacting their ability to recover. Right, right. Um, or if it's something that just makes them miserable, right. then they need to get help. Right, right. I, I like to just address the audience for a minute. Um, and just make you aware that um, if you're in New York State that if you have a car accident and you've been injured and you've been out of work and you're starting to feel these symptoms of depression, helplessness, I'm never going to get better, um, that this is a covered expense under your no, New York State no-fault car insurance. We are able to see a, a licensed um, psychologist or neuropsychologist to help you with these symptoms and how to cope with them and get by them so you so you can recover. And it's very important for us in our practice as clinicians um, dealing with their physical um, problems that their emotional ones are dealt with at the same time because no matter what a job we do, what a great job we do helping the physical um, heal, if the emotional is still hurt, that physical is not going to heal because of the wheel concept that we just talked about. Um, do you agree with that? Absolutely, and not only that, but you know, recovery <coughs> takes so much. It's so hard when you um, were able to do things before, and now when you're trying to do them, they're painful. You're realizing that you can't do them, and that can be incredibly overwhelming. So right. giving somebody strategies to help manage that so that they're able to make the most out of their recovery and heal is incredibly important. Right. Have you ever, I'm sure you have, but I'd like to hear your response anyway, been in a situation where you've got, let's say, I don't care about the gender, a patient that has been in a, tr in a car accident, they're going through uh, anxiety, they're going through depression, they can't work, and they say to you, my spouse doesn't believe me, they think I'm full of garbage, and they want me to get over this and get back to work. Have you, de have you dealt with that? When you're dealing with... When it comes, well, actually, both. Uh, that's. I was going to ask you a question in return, but now I'm going to say the answer is both. I was going to say, is it when somebody just has a brain injury, or like a mild brain injury, or when is it when somebody has an emotional response? The answer is yes, both. Because when it comes to brain injury, what ends up happening is that, particularly if the person doesn't have other physical symptoms, um, they're not in a wheelchair, they don't need a rolling walker, right. they can look absolutely fine. Right. And yet with the brain injury, the brain injury can change them emotionally. It could cause changes in their personality. Uh, sometimes when people have a brain injury, they find that little things that annoyed them before now can make them furious. It's like their right. emotions go to zero to 60 in like two yeah, seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then on the other hand, sometimes people, in terms of not even just brain injury, but these different issues with anxiety and depression, we have a very poor understanding in our mm -hmm. culture of what that is. Usually we think of depression as, you know, oh, you know, I didn't get to go to the show I wanted to, I'm so depressed. Or, oh, the dress that was in my size last is taken, I'm right. so depressed. But it's not depression, right. it's disappointment. Right, But right. depression, I mean, the, yes, so the answer is yes. Right. Some people actually don't believe that their family member is going through right. something. And that makes it difficult. more difficult for that patient. Right, and right. sometimes counseling the family member in terms of what's going on. Is that was going to be my next too. question. Absolutely. Okay. Educating the family is right. incredibly important. And I hear it from patients who've had depression before where people say, yeah, I get that way sometimes. Just go out for a walk, you'll feel better. Mm -hmm. Now with depression. Right, 
It's not that easy. No, not at all. I wish well, you were. Well, Dr. Lepore, I want to thank you very much for being our guest, and we're going to have you back on the next show and talk about some other interesting things. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having we'll me. I appreciate back. it. For those of you watching us on Madhouse TV, stay tuned. We'll be right back. And for those watching us on Cablevision, we'll see you next time. But remember, if you want real wealth, join us next time on The Bridge to Health.
Finally, the time has come. You no longer have to choose between conventional medicine and alternative medicine. Today, unlike years past, your team of doctors from all disciplines are working together side by side for the benefit of you, the patient, to help you regain your health and cross the bridge. Hi again, welcome back to the Bridge to Health. My name is Dr. Tom Dow. Um, and each week we have a special guest uh, in a different healthcare discipline uh, who's part of our healthcare team uh, working hand in hand for you, the patient, to give you the best possible treatment and to treat the whole person, not just parts. Um, I'd like to welcome back, back Dr. Anne Marie Lapore a neuropsychologist. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having me again. So our last show was extremely interesting. We talked mainly about uh, trauma, um, the, the cognitive changes that people have after trauma. Um, I'd like to focus a little bit on this show uh, more about uh, a thing called depression. Okay. So can you explain to the audience first what is depression? Um, oftentimes people <coughs> think of depression as just feeling sad. Um, and sometimes you can even ask somebody who's experiencing depression, do you feel sad? And their answer is no. Um, depression is an illness that affects so much. It affects your mood. It affects your ability to process information, your concentration ability. It can affect your appetite. It can affect your sleep. Um, and it's something that causes quite a bit of disability. Um, so a person who has depression uh, may have difficulty working. Uh, they may have difficulty getting up out of bed in the morning. They may have difficulty making decisions. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that depression encompasses. Okay. So, and I'm sure there is a depression which is very, very minimal on a scale and depression which is catastrophic on it. So there's all different grades sure, and degrees absolutely. of this, right? Um, and, you know, I find depression an extremely interesting topic because of, just because of the way that different people deal with depression in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, I, I mean, sometimes I get depressed and the way, I, the way I know I'm depressed is my body gets very tired. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I'm exhausted, I want to lay down, I, and as soon as I wake up, I'm out of it. Right. And that's more like a depressed mood. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean you have depression. Okay, okay. But that may be just a depressed but mood. But I just know that if I go to sleep and I just don't think about what I'm thinking about and I wake up, it's like a brand new day when I wake up. Yeah. Whereas others, they just can't lift that off and, and, and do anything to make that disappear, right? Absolutely. That feeling. Yeah. Um, and it could be so that, um, you know, even, even sometimes somatically, people get aches and pains during depression. They may even think it's something physical that okay. they have. So there's a lot of different ways that depression sort of shows up. Um, sometimes when people are experiencing depression, they also have quite a bit of anxiety. Mm -hmm, sometimes mm -hmm. if they're having appetite changes, they feel like they want to eat all of the time to mm -hmm. self-soothe, mm -hmm. um, which I believe you mentioned previously. Right, right. Um, sometimes people find that when they're depressed, they just have no appetite whatsoever and they have weight loss. Wow. Sometimes people, when they're depressed, have difficulty with their motivation, so getting up out of bed and deciding what to eat is just too overwhelming, so then they don't eat. Right. So is depression something that is biochemical in the brain? Uh, is it something that is learned or, or kind of like you develop it as, as you're aging? 
What what exactly causes it? The answer to that is yes. All yeah, those, nobody all knows, those right? Things. It's not that nobody knows. Um, there's some. There may be some genetic component to it. <coughs> um, certainly, uh, coping styles that you have learned from your parents and you've learned in your family may be part of it. Um, so there are a lot of different factors that come into play that could cause somebody to have depression. And typically people will attribute a stress or something that's recently happened to depression. What I would say is that sometimes people are predisposed to have depression. And um, when something happens in their lives that causes a dramatic change, whether it's a change in relationship, a change in their marriage, or a loss of a job, uh, sometimes what happens then is then they tend to experience the, the symptoms. They'll tend to have an exacerbation of their depression. Great. And how is that treated? Uh, oftentimes depression is treated using medication, uh, which helps to regulate the chemicals that are related to the depressed mood. Um, and then some, and it's also treated in terms of therapy, uh, which is very important to educate people about de their depression so that they understand what the symptoms are. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people will say in my practice, you know, I'm feeling a lot better, I'm not feeling sad anymore. And I'll say, great, how's your concentration? No, oh, not so great. Mm. Uh, how's your sleep? Well, I'm still having a hard time sleeping. Well, guess what? You still have depression. These right. are all symptoms that we have to work on. Right, right, right. And definitely sometimes they, they have to have medication in conjunction with what you're doing. Yes. Uh, and sometimes, depending on the person's depression, some people need to take medication throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people uh, are able to develop coping strategies where they can manage their depression and eventually right. wean off of medication. Uh, and I think it's very important when you're in treatment with a psychologist and a uh, psychiatrist who prescribes the medication that you communicate with them very clearly what's going on with you. So well, I just want to add, sometimes people make the mistake of <coughs> saying, you know what, I'm feeling a lot better, so I'm going to stop taking my medication. I don't need it anymore. And yet the medication is the thing that's helping them to keep those symptoms in check. So how does a patient know who's taking medication, let's say two or three different medications, at the same time doing psycho psychotherapy, dealing, learning coping skills, how do they know which one's working and which one's not? They, do you recommend that maybe they contact their psychiatrist and say, I feel like I'm, I can cope with this better. Can we cut it back a little bit and see what happens? I see what you're saying. So you're, you not, have, do, not do it themselves. Right. Have the absolutely. expert help them with absolutely, that. Absolutely, absolutely. <coughs> so if somebody is finding that their symptoms are better and they're saying, you know what, I'm, I'm feeling better, I'm able to focus and work, I'm able to concentrate, my sleeping is better, my appetite is better, I just feel a lot better. Do you think maybe we could cut back on some of these medications? And by the way, they may not just be taking medications for depression. Anxiety goes along with that right, too, right. sometimes. So they might be taking an anti-anxiety medication. Right. Well, depending on what they're noticing in terms of an improvement, yes, they should communicate with their right. psychiatrist right. and say, what do you think, should we scale back on this? Right. Or should we stop And the psychiatrist this? may say, no, we're not gonna cut it all out, but we'll go from 20 milligrams to 15 now. Absolutely. And then see how you deal with that. Exactly, so regular follow-up is important. Right. So you're working pretty closely a lot of times with the psychiatrist mm -hmm. on these things. Right. Again, that's the team, working with each other to exactly. see what's going on. Um, so if you have a patient um, that says, I feel like I want to hurt myself, I'm thinking that I don't want to live anymore, what do you recommend to anybody in the audience right now that might be thinking that? Anybody who, first of all, <coughs> um, sometimes we have this idea that, you know, with depression, it's not like an illness where, for example, if you have some gastrointestinal illness, it doesn't feel like you, okay? This is my stomach that's bothering me. When it comes to depression, which affects your mood, how you think about yourself, uh, your uh, ability to focus, uh, those sort of things, it really feels like you. So when you start having these thoughts, they feel very real. Mm -hmm. um, and that old expression of somebody looking at the world for rose-colored glasses, where they right. see everything is wonderful, well, when you're having thoughts of feeling like, I want to hurt myself or I don't want to live anymore, you have to imagine that this is the depression that's at, that's working. Right. Um, that you're really looking at the world through depression-colored glasses. And mm -hmm. that is a very serious symptom mm -hmm. um, because a person may impulsively decide that they're going to do something to hurt themselves. Whereas if they didn't have the depression, they would never imagine doing something like that. Right. So they really need to get help immediately. So if that person is already in treatment, 
um, contact their psychologist immediately, contact their psychiatrist immediately, have them evaluate the person to see how safe they are. Mm -hmm. If you cannot get in touch with them, um, bring them to an emergency room mm -hmm. and have them evaluated there. When it comes to that, safety is the most important thing. Right. Right. Uh, safety trumps everything when we do. Right. I'm sure there's many. I'm sure there's many parents out there watching who have teenagers or adolescents that the, the, the teenagers have said, oh, I want to kill myself, I don't want to live anymore, and they brush it off and they say, ah, that's just being a teenager. Yeah. Uh, they'll, they'll grow out of that, right. where really it might be something serious that should be looked into. Exactly. Well, think about it. I mean, if you can imagine your teenage kid saying this to you, which is worse, that you go to the emergency room and then you sit there and then they mm. have the evaluation, you find out it's nothing and then they go home and they're right. fine, or that they actually do something and they harm themselves. Right. They should look at it just like a, uh, an infant falls down and gets a bump on their head. Yeah. And what do you do? You, you just wait to see if the, the, the baby uh, ends up bleeding or you bring them to the doctor and they test them and say he's okay. Yeah. Same kind of thing. I, can, I conceptualize this as, uh, you know, <coughs> having the tingling in your arm and the pain in your chest that you need to go get that checked out right away. Right. This is life threatening. Right. This is like the heart it's attack. Yeah, you know, it's like the same thing. It's a life threatening aspect of the illness that has to be checked right away. And and by the okay. way, sometimes people end up going to the hospital for treatment for that. Sometimes they don't. Right. Sometimes, depending on the severity of those types of symptoms, it could be managed on an outpatient basis. Right. But safety is always the most important thing. What is EMDR? Oh, that's interesting that you asked me that. <laughs> We're not even talking about that right now. Um, EMDR is a treatment for typically that's used for dealing with trauma um, and it stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing um, and it was a type of therapy that was developed by a psychologist named Francine Shapiro back in the late 80s and uh, there's the famous story from EMDR therapists like myself who know that one day she was walking in the park and she was thinking thoughts that were bothering her and she noticed that her eyes were moving back and forth and that she felt better, um, strangely. Like and side to side? Side to side, uh -huh. okay. So um, then she started <coughs> grabbing people and saying, you know, something bothering you, you know, I mean like just to test it out, you know, something bothering you, let me, you know, tell me what it is and she would use these eye movements where they would kind of follow her fingers back and forth and uh, they noticed that they were getting relief from it. Hmm. Um, and from there, she developed this therapy, but it's typically used for trauma therapy. We did talk about trauma a bit in our last session. Yes. But what does it actually do? I mean, how does it make them feel better? Does anybody know what it does to the brain? Okay. The idea behind it is that generally, and we touched upon this at our last session a little bit, we tend to um, take in information and process the information from all of our senses. We process it, we integrate the information, and then usually we lay down memories about this. And the memories come in the form of stories, um, usually. So we can think of stories from our past and bring up emotions that are from our past. Uh, and the entire thing is integrated. And our experience of it is that it's completely in the past. What happens during trauma is that something happens that's so overwhelming that can feel life-threatening at that point and your brain is not processing that information as it normally does. Um, so what ends up happening is that you may pr process the information in kind of a fragmented way. So a person who's undergone trauma, as we talked about in our last session, um, where, for example, maybe they were in a car accident. Um, if they hear a large bang, well then suddenly they're getting the sensation of being overwhelmed and anxious where it may have just been a book falling on the floor. Um, so something that happens now will trigger aspects of that memory um, and it will come up as though the trauma is happening in present time. Hmm. So what EMDR does is, the theory behind it, is that basically what it does is it helps the mind to process information um, in a way so that it's normally processed, the way we process our usual memories. Um, and why does it work? We're trying to figure out why it works. One thing that we know is that when you go to sleep at night, um, you go through various stages of sleep. And when you're dreaming, we, we believe that you're processing information, whether it's information that you've learned throughout the day or emotional issues that are going on during the day. Sometimes you might notice that things are a little different in your dream than what happens during the day, but a lot of the same feelings are there, even mm -hmm. though it might be a little bit strange. 
Um, but what happens during the time that you're dreaming is we call that the REM phase of sleep, right. and that stands for rapid eye movement. Mm -hmm. So as you're dreaming, your eyes are moving back and forth on their own. So this may have something to do with how we're processing the information. Interesting. So maybe we're, it seems as though we're capitalizing on that to help people to process information. So I have a, I have a really interesting question, which you may not know the answer to, or no one may know the answer to. But I've read research <coughs> on sleep REM deprivation studies, mm -hmm. where they've actually taken uh, uh, patients who volunteer for the study, and when they, st with electrodes on their brains and everything, and when they first start to enter this rapid eye movement sleep, they wake them up. Mm -hmm. And they keep waking them up for days at a time. Right. And what happens to them is they end up sometimes becoming psychotic, and <laughs> sleep deprivation will do that. <laughs> yeah, and they hallucinate, right. and they mm -hmm. they go through all these things. Um, is this therapy you're talking about with the eye movement helping their brains heal, like REM sleep does, something like that? I tend to look at it more as um, it's helping them to create memories. There are also studies that show that. If, and they would have control groups. So if you, if you wake up somebody consistently during REM phase, and you have another control group where it's non-REM phase, and they have tasks that they've learned during the day, the folks with the REM phase interruption will tend to perform poorly or not remember right. the task later on. But right. definitely there's lots of studies to show that, yes, you get psychotic-like symptoms when yeah. you are sleep deprived. That makes yeah. sense for anybody who, out there who right. has gone it's, without it's, sleep it's for a while. It's interesting because when I dream, I dream a lot, um, I wake up and there's always something that happened the day before mm -hmm. that's similar in, it might be a face, it might be something right. that's similar to what I was dreaming about. Not right. exactly, but, right. but, but so that's what's happening. Is it kind of like it's, our brains like the, the, storing? A, there, yeah, that's, it's part of the way we process information. The other thing that's very tricky about dealing with trauma, because when you have trauma, like I mentioned before, sometimes something that happens in present time can trigger the trauma. You're experiencing the memory as though it's happening now. Uh, in my field, there's a difference between what we call explicit memory and implicit memory. Right. Okay. So, for example, I'll tell you. Is do I have time to tell you a little story Absol and make an illustration? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, one time I was my husband and I fell asleep and I woke up, and my husband was having a terrible dream. Okay, where he he was yelling and not yelling loud, but you could tell he was distressed by this dream and he was very upset. My wife usually hits me when I do that. So, well, I was being kinder. <laughs> I was being kinder. And I, said, I, said, I said, Louis, wake up, wake up. You know, you're having a dream. So Lou, responding to this dream, grabs his pillow and whacks me with this. Okay? <laughs> so, of course, it takes me a couple of minutes to kind of get my bearings because it's 3 o'clock in the morning. And um, I turn around, and I'm furious. I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you? I was trying to wake you up and help you, and you're hitting me with this pillow. Okay, so when I tell you this story now, and I'm, uh, it's, a, it's a memory that completely happened in the past. Uh -huh. So even the emotions, even the anger that I was feeling, obviously it's not a trauma, right. but even the emotions that I'm feeling, I'm experiencing them as something that has completely been in the past. Okay? Right. But if you're talking with somebody, say, about a car accident that they had, and you're saying, tell me about this car accident, what can happen is that the thoughts of the car accident will find that their heart is racing or they're becoming anxious or maybe they're getting sounds or maybe they're getting smells of what happened. Mm -hmm. You have to be so careful when you're dealing with trauma because you have to have it so that they're here, uh, the way I describe it is that they're here with you in the room, they're in present time. And right. they recognize that on some level all of this is something that happened in the past. So part of EMDR is keeping them with you in present time and making it so that they're able to look at this as though it's a movie that's happened and process all wow. the emotions that have gone on before. Because before it was thrown as a fragment. It's a, it, not only is it a fragment, but they're re-experiencing it. Now it's you not, want to make we call a, a clear strip. Right. Now what we're doing is we're helping them to recognize that this was in the past. But in order to do that, we have to help their brains or their right. minds to integrate the information as though it's all happened in the past. Cool. And what happens is you have to be very careful because when we're dealing with trauma, there's what we call a window of tolerance, and it has to do with our response to stress. So as you can imagine, most people, when something becomes overwhelming, they experience anxiety. Their heart races, their breathing becomes faster. 
Um, there's just this feeling of being overwhelmed, mm -hmm. um, and that's above the window of tolerance, right. okay? So we have to be able to bring them back down into that therapeutic window. Right. Sometimes when people have experienced very bad trauma, uh, instead of having that fight-flight response, they have more of a freeze and collapse response, uh -huh. where instead they might find that they become like they can't take in information around them, they might feel faint, they notice that their heart rate decreases instead, uh -huh. Um, and then we have to stop too and keep making sure they stay within that window of tolerance. Otherwise you can re-traumatize the person. Well, how does one, how does a patient or, or an audience member out there go about finding an EMDR therapist? Um, a great source uh, for that is uh, the Emdria website. And I wish I had it on me, but if you Google Emdria, um, there's a whole Spell list that. of E-M-D-R-I-A, okay. and it stands for EMDR, which is Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing International Association. Okay. So they're able to look on there and find an EMDR therapist that way. Um, can um, you, can, can and you and also, it's also I'm sorry, I just want to yeah, add too, because uh -huh. I have to do this in fairness, it's not the only treatment for trauma. Certainly talk therapy can be useful. It's very useful in helping people to develop resources usually before they are able to go into that deeper phase of processing. Um, and also uh, there is more somatic types of therapy where you're teaching people about where they're feeling this in their body and how to manage that. Are there a lot of EMDR therapists in Nassau and Suffolk County? Yes, okay. actually there are. Can you um, let the audience know how to contact you if they have questions? Absolutely. Uh, you can contact me uh, on my number, 516-491-6080. Right. And you have an office with in our building yes. in Melville. Mm -hmm. um, very convenient for the patients to get to right off the LIE exit 49. Right. Um, what, so what is talk therapy? Just, just like psychotherapy? Well, talking I'm just talking about, about traditional, yeah, talk oh. therapy. And oftentimes it's, it's helping people to recognize things like, you know, it really wasn't. You know, sometimes when people are in a trauma, they develop negative thoughts about themselves. <coughs> like um, if they were in an accident, they'll say, you know what, it's my fault I was in this accident. Or um, I should have done something different. Oftentimes if they're in an accident and somebody doesn't survive in the accident, mm -hmm. they have such guilt about the fact that they weren't able to help that person. They may have not been able to help them. Right. Um, so talk therapy is basically helping them to come to terms with that. Mm. Uh, I, my understanding is that traditional therapy tends to take a little bit longer in doing this, uh, uh, but it also can be effective because um, you're really dealing with the story. And I find that um, other types of therapy like EMDR therapy, um, somatic types of therapy actually help to get at the feelings. Because you know, you could even say to yourself, you know what, I know it really wasn't my fault, but yet I still feel this way. So I find that the somatic therapy and the EMDR therapy helps to make that connection a little bit more quickly. Interesting. How did you come to become a neuropsychologist? What triggered <laughs> you to say, that's my passion, that's what I'd like to do? I had this delusion when I was in my 20s that somehow I would be able to figure out exactly how the brain worked. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're dealing a couple of decades later and I'm still figuring that out. We're still trying to figure it just, that out. It just was like extremely interesting to you. Yeah, it really was. Do you enjoy your work? I love my work. I love my work and, and you know, different neuropsychologists have different practices. So some deal primarily with uh, just doing neuropsychological assessments. Uh, some deal with neuropsychological assessments and work very heavily on doing rehabilitation in terms of helping to build back skills, like building back attention when it's lost. Right. Uh, some people work with kids and, and do work in terms of helping kids maybe who have ADHD improve with their symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, some psychologists, like myself, also do psychotherapy. It's really nice that I get to have both in my right. practice. Well, I can tell you for sure that every single patient I've referred to you um, at our Melville location, they have nothing but great things to say oh, about you. Thank you. you. They love you, um, and you've helped them a lot, especially our car accident victims. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to thank you once again for joining us on the show, and I hope to have you back again someday. Great, I would love that. Great. And once again, we're about to wrap up the show. Um, as I said in the past, our offices are located in Melville, Ronkonkoma, Medford, and Hicksville, where we have a team of doctors like Dr. Lapore, um, of many different disciplines, um, all working together for the benefit of you, the patient, to give you the best health care possible and treat everything that possibly can be treated to help you regain optimal health and get across that bridge. 
So until next time, if you want real wealth, join us next time on The Bridge to Health. Thank you.